Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for those who have stayed behind for the remaining afternoon sessions. Uh, I have no doubt that this will be, um, in my opinion, one of the most riveting sessions of the day. Uh, and we are joined by a very esteemed group of speakers who I will shortly introduce. But I just thought it would be good to start kind of recapping some of the things we've been talking about today and some of what we find in terms of this ecosystem and such a timely conference, a global health forum. There is no doubt from what we're hearing today that the need for digital transformation in health is immediate and it's real. Uh, and we are seeing that the supplies and demand in healthcare continue to be variable. And the amount of access of care that patients have continues to be variable. It's interesting also when we see globally, uh, despite so much spending going into healthcare, an increase in spending year on year about 6%, growing at a rise faster than the GDP, we're still not really seeing genuine reform in healthcare that can be tangible and something that designs what the new healthcare will look like. And so we're starting to look for a paradigm shift. And we've seen over the last five years a significant amount of spending going into digital technologies, intelligent health systems, and ways to really transform healthcare uh, and what the new era of healthcare will look like, which may be very, very different to the traditional methods that we've encountered and used over the last decades and centuries. Of course, it's very important, and as we continue to talk about the patient and the patient journey, that during these experiences, not only do we consider the financial implications, um, the efficiency and optimization of the users and the supply and demand workforce, but also we think about the patient and the patient journey throughout that. Joining me today, uh, as I said, we have a very esteemed panel of speakers who I'm very honored to be presenting to you today. Um, I'll, in I'll introduce them individually, and then they'll each join us for a short presentation, and then we'll take questions and answers at the end. So our first speaker is Dr. Adam Smail. He's a senior biomedical engineer with over 20 years of experience as an international healthcare technology professional. He's currently in charge of essential medicines and health technology programs in the Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office of the WHO. His current duties involve assisting member states in developing national strategies and programs in the areas of health technologies, designing regional tools and guidelines, promoting intersectoral collaboration with relevant institutions, and really strengthening national capacity in developing health technology assessment and management systems. He's a graduate of Alexandria University. He earned a P BSc in Electrical Communications Engineering and an MSc in Biomedical Engineering in 1994. He then went on to University of Miami, where he there received a PhD in Biomedical Engineering and was part of the Arab Academy of Science Technology, where he completed his managerial capabilities with an MBA in 2004. He's world-renowned in this area. He's published many articles and journal papers on this, and he's participated in many national and international conferences. And it's an honor for us to have him today. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. And um, well, uh, let me start by saying that uh, I was advised uh, when I entered WHO not to ever present in the last session, because this is what we get, right? <laughs> limited amount of people, but it's okay. I mean, um, um, let me say that, uh, first explain to each and every one of you where I am coming from. This presentation is about public health. I am a, um, a WHO staff. We as WHO advise countries on how to do things right, how in terms of public health. And, uh, and this is where I am coming from. Uh, so the whole presentation is about access and how to improve access to health technologies in low and middle-income countries, and this is what we want to achieve. So, uh, of course, when we use the right technologies in the right amounts um, at the right time, definitely this will improve the service delivery uh, of the country, and uh, and it will be easier for them to deliver quality and at the same time essential services for their citizens. And this has been demonstrated during the Sustainable Development Goals and the UN. 190 something member states have signed on that uh, that they are that they want uh, to deliver to by 2030 uh, for their citizens to achieve to achieve 17 different sustainable development goals one of them actually number 3 is about health and what do we mean by health one if you look at the it has different targets within the health itself but if you look within the health uh, targets, you will achieve explicitly what's said that countries need to achieve what we call now the lit motive of the new era, universal health coverage. And in doing so, you need to access, to have access to quality, safe, affordable, and effective essential medicines and vaccines for all as part of the technology. 
It also stresses the research of development of new products as well, and to provide access. Is, so it has been repeated several times, and this is what th this whole session is all about, access, and how to improve access to those technologies. I've heard a lot of talks since early mornings about fragile states, about e-health, and about many things. And uh, this might be the presentation that puts everything together in a system. Because what I've seen up till now is unique solutions, but there is no system for the country to follow. We have to have systems in countries to be able to promote access in an equitable way. In which this is the buzzword that the last session was looking for, equity. So in order to do that, let's first set the, uh, the platform for, for all of us. What do I mean by health technologies? What does WHO mean by health technologies? Because there is a, a misconception that it means equipment and medicines and vaccines. That's not true. When we met together, and I was part of this team who, who advised WHO on the on the, uh, on, the, on the definition, and as you can see, the definition is broad enough, and I won't recite it because it's on the screen, but anything that you do, any kind of organized knowledge and skills that will help to do two things, solve health problem and improve the quality of lives. So the, the, the definition is broad enough to include even promotion and prevention activities. If you have a new marketing way, if you have a new hospital financing scheme, all of these are considered technologies, by the way. So it, it's not necessarily something that we, uh, so if you look at this, in respect, this is what we mean by, uh, by health technologies. And the side of the circles really uh, is proportionate to the number of products in the market. So as you can see, the medical devices are huge. Thousands and thousands are there. But the medicine is less, not less important, but less in number of generic uh, uh, m medicines floating. There are things that are technology and not, for example, ICT equipment, last session, e-health, m-health. So there is part in the mobile that's used for health, but there are other parts that can be used elsewhere. That's why it has only an intersection. So therefore, the term technology includes more than medicine, uh, more than medical devices. It even includes blood products, some herbal medicines, and so on. But Medicine and having access to medicine doesn't mean that you have a good health system because you, medicine and technologies in general is one of six building blocks of a good health system. However, if you take out the access, a good access to medications and, and, and health technologies, the whole system collapses. So there are six things that you have to put together in a mixer in order to improve the access, uh, the, the access function as you can see right here. There are six things that here that leads to better access. Also, it leads to coverage, quality, safety, and others. But six things you have to do together to achieve it. Financing, information, health workforce, and we heard health workforce in the afternoon, and medicine is, is one of them. And without these, so therefore, let's agree that to have a good health system, you have to have good access to health technologies. And to have good access to health technologies, you have to have a good health system. So it's really... It, things are interchanging, and we have to focus on both. But how can we do that in middle and low and middle income countries, where we spend most of our money, 20 to 60 percent of our annual budgets, on buying medicines and technologies? And I have no problem if these are bought for for a good purpose or really needed. But our research in WHO shows that well over 50 percent of that expenditure is wasted due to over sophistication, due to uh, uh, and, um, you know, uh, uh, irrational use, uh, and so on. You tend to buy stuff that, and how many of us have seen medical equipment left idle in corridors, medicines that are getting expired in their warehouses, and things like that. This happens in low and middle income countries, you know, because our market, our health technology market is not organized. Forget about everything I said. Let me ask you a question. Any one of you who wants to buy a car or a TV, what does he do, do, typically do? This is what he typically does. There are two steps before he even sees the car on the streets, research and development by the company and market authorization, which we call regulation in medicine. These are two steps done. You haven't seen the car yet. Now you go, you recognize the need for a car. You need something to buy. So what do you do? You make some information research, you evaluate alternatives, you take a purchase decision, you go and buy it, and then you provide feedback for the company or your good self about the performance of what you bought. This is typically a consumer buying, and I got this from textbooks of um, business. This is exactly what we want to do with technologies. You want to have a better access? Have a system, please. 
have a system. Research and development part, we call it innovation. And this is what you've, the word that you've been hearing around every day. The market authorization part, we call it in medicine regulation, like FDA, like CE, and all of these people. If you recognize a problem, that's a public health need that you want to solve using these technologies. And then if you go and, in, in, and search alternatives and collect information, this is what we call HTA. How many of you heard about health technology assessment? If you do that, you take the purchase decision, you buy it, you train people on using it, and so on, that's called health technology management, HTM. This is a typical HTM, HTA regulation, and this is exactly what we want to do in countries, and I want you to memorize this, please. If you only take this slide away with you when you go out of this room, I'll be happy. Because this is what we, what we you want to improve access, you have to have a system. First, you start with an umbrella policy that explains the role of the country in improving access through putting some policies that explain what the country should do in terms of R&D, what is the role of the country to improve access through good regulatory affair, uh, uh, HTA and health technology management. So this is exactly what we look at, and all of these complete the cycle of good access and good uh, promotion. But how can we do that? Where this system, which, which I'm explaining, are found in the developed world, but in our world, this is the situation. We need an intervention. 50% of, our, uh, 50 of our medical equipment is not functioning, not used uh, correctly and invariably not maintained. 50% of our medicines are irrationally prescribed. 50% of our expenditure on medicine vaccines is wasted. Only 18 countries have not, uh, 18 countries, I'm sorry, have not updated their essential medicines list meaning they are buying things from 20 or 30 years just by habitually. They haven't looked into the validity and the cost effectiveness of these medicines. Two only out of 22 countries have HTA agency, which needs a lot of support. Four countries only produce vaccines. None of them are WHO pre-qualified, meaning no, no, not a single country will buy from you because you're not pre-qualified by WHO as uh, good manufacturing practices. And none of them uh, on a scale of one to five, when we assessed the regulatory agencies in this region, none of them reached maturity level three, which is essential for your products to be exported to other uh, countries. The situation is bad. And in order to do that, and you know what? This is a haven for suppliers because our, our markets are supplier driven. And, you, and you, you speak about access, and I speak, and when I go see a hospital, I found them not providing basic medicines, but they are changing their MRI from three Tesla to whatever, higher. Unbelievable. It's chaotic. We need to put a system to improve access. We need to rationalize our expenditures, and this could be done, as I said, through, th through three, th three things. Regulation, which is strengthening your national regulatory authority. Choices of alternatives through HTA, and at the end, some proper plans. And if you do these, you will definitely achieve the good health technology outcomes which will impact public health lives as WHO is uh, predicting. This is a recap of what I say, and I'll stop here because of time, but I spoke about if you want to implement SDG, we go backwards. Then you have to really promote the six building blocks in, including uh, the technologies. Therefore, you have to put that system into place, and in order to do that, you have seven implementation requirements here. So do this. Th these are my final recommendations. Prioritize your public health needs. Identify your health system building blocks relations. Develop major areas of work. Prepare your, your human and financial resources. Develop an organizational structure for this health technology system. Identify the terms of reference of each of these processes. And develop a core set of indicators to measure your performance. If you do that, you will improve, definitely improve access at least to the essential services that the country needs by, over, by really making a good decisions on investments and a good return on your investments on essential packages. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Asmi. That was very, very important points about the importance of change management, the importance of structure and process, and something we'll pick up in the q and I'd like to introduce our second speaker. Uh, he's a colleague, Dr. Usama al Hajj. He's an NHS England clinical entrepreneur and a consultant neurologist at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital in London, one of the largest hospitals in the UK. He's a senior lecturer at King's College, and in addition to a surgical and academic career, he has also co-invented and currently developing a new surgical grasper for use in laparoscopic and robotic surgery. 
He's part of the Tertiary Referral Center for the Treatment of Large Prostates, and he regularly performs laser enucleation of the prostate and assesses patients for prostate artery embolization. He has published and presented over 100 papers, book chapters, abstracts, and lectures internationally. And his main scientific interests are in the immunology of the prostate, the genomics and the genotyping of ductal cancers, and he has described their prognosis for the first time. Thank you, Dr. Hajj. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll be talking to you a bit about um, innovation, <coughs> but mainly the technological aspect of it, and we'll touch on the evidence base, and we'll talk about scaling health after that as well. Um, you'll realize very quickly throughout the talk that all the innovation aspects of um, uh, uh, modern innovation aspect, they're all interlinked um, between the hardware, the wearables, um, the augmented reality, and the wireless network, which we'll talk about as well. <coughs> Just um, uh, to, um, uh, to talk about the initial big um, system, uh, robotic system being used for the last 17 years, super expensive, um, everyone wants to use it. Um, this is the Da Vinci system. Um, it does provide very um, excellent access to the pelvis, and you'll be able to do pelvic surgery with it. Now ENT wants to use it, and uh, thoracic surgeons wants to use it. People talk about this as the 21st century scalpel. However, the recent studies suggesting actually um, the outcomes of, of the operations from this um, surgery is actually sp surgeon specific rather than technology specific. Um, and you'll be interested to find out the, uh, the patent is, uh, has run out four years ago on this uh, system and plenty of companies are lining up to fill in the gap or uh, to enter the market and uh, uh, plenty of them had already acquired FDA approval and they're coming in next year. Of course, this will improve or maybe will decrease the, um, uh, the cost of the, of the systems, but they may not be available to the lower and middle income countries. Um, the next one is uh, slightly more um, uh, available to lower and middle income countries, um, uh, people where wearables uh, um, uh, is, um, we talk about this. Um, Apple has introduced uh, this FDA approved Apple Watch only last, uh, last month. And there's a Mr. Pearson, who's a man in Northern England um, last May, I was visiting his dad in the hospital and found that his Apple Watch actually had detected a high pulse rate. And he thought the watch is faulty. And he went and saw a, a nurse who checked and actually found that he, he does have atrial fibrillation and he was treated for that. Um, <clears throat> so Apple is now trying to introduce Apple Watch as a um, health kind of device rather than a sporty type of device. Um, there's another one which uh, does have a FDA approval. This uh, this device, if you're sitting uh, in your co in a coffee shop and you and suddenly you have a chest pain, you could easily uh, uh, use your fingers and get an ECG reading, and you could send it via WhatsApp to your uh, to your cardiologist or even email it to your cardiologist. You'll get an immediate diagnosis. So this is really at the tip of your finger. Um, it's it is still expensive, um, but it does have FDA approval. Um, these are very exciting um, uh, developments, but the most exciting of them all is actually the, the, the introduction of the 5G network, uh, which is coming in the next few years. It will come in the high-income country first, but of course it will, it will be um, all around the world. And uh, um, the networks that we use nowadays is the 3G. If you're lucky, you get 4G. Um, you could watch your Netflix on the 4G, not so much on the 3G. The next big thing is the 5G. 5G is faster. Um, it does have greater capacity, um, very ultra-low um, latency, but this is not the whole story. 5G doesn't only connect people, it does connect things. Uh, so if you, nowadays it's still, it is available actually, you've got a fridge which is connected to the internet. If you're running out of milk, uh, your fridge will recognize that. It will automatically order the milk from your local shop which will get delivered <coughs> and you'll pay, you, you already paid for it and will get delivered to your home. So um, 5G is the internet of things. It will connect your life 
um, in the future, from manufacturing to traffic safety. Both cars, you're driving along the motorway, and uh, the car in front of you and your car will, <coughs> will talk to each other and will be able to, you, uh, both cars will be able to alert the other cars um, whether there's any uh, heavy traffic so you could slow down and this will improve, uh, will improve the, the safety um, and, uh, um, and decrease congestion. Um, but of course, what, what we're interested in is, um, is healthcare and uh, there's a promise that 5G will improve the training. Uh, in healthcare, this is uh, in our uh, university. Um, there is a smart. We, this is a co uh, um, collaboration with Ericsson. Um, uh, we developed a, a smart glove uh, where you could get a haptic feedback on it, and uh, uh, with the help of augmented reality, you'll be able to remotely uh, move the fingers. Hopefully, be able to do an operation. Uh, with this or supervise someone who's doing an operation maybe uh, in inaccessible or very uh, distant rural, rural area or uh, um, in emergency situations as well. And of course, if you're, if you're not that busy, you could play the piano remotely as well. Um, <coughs> um, so 5G will make augmented reality uh, even more impressive. Augmented reality is available now, but 5G will make it more impressive in the future. Um, I think all of you be familiar with Pokemon Go. Uh, this is the gaming, augmented reality for gaming. Uh, but healthcare, we, we do have few uh, uh, systems where we'll be able to, where we're using augmented reality. And of course, uh, HoloLens and uh, Google Glass are very interested in this. And uh, um, although we ha they haven't got any um, uh, medical applications yet, uh, the, the leading um, a company in augmented reality is Proximy, and uh, Nadine in, in here is leading on this. Um, this is a, a platform for training and um, uh, for supervision and training. And this is Warren, one of our trainees at Guy's Hospital in London. Uh, he's performing a robotic operation, and his supervisor, he's a trainee, so his supervisor is not in the room, but his supervisor is using the Proximy uh, platform to guide him uh, live. Um, during the operation to tell him where to cut and how to operate. And uh, he completed, Warren completed the operation successfully <coughs> with the help of, of Proximy. Um, so this is a snapshot of what's been happening in the technological world, but is there evidence to what we do? Um, yes, there is, and uh, although it's a bit late, um, and usually the evidence comes a bit later and delayed, this is a, uh, a randomized controlled trial from Australia where they looked, only recent in the last few years, looked at a few hundred patients and they randomized them to robotic surgery. We're talking about prostate removal. This is the most commonly robotic procedure performed and uh, open surgery, so robotic surgery and open surgery. And found actually there's no difference between the, in the outcome. There's no difference between robotic arm and the uh, open arm. Uh, however, um, the, the boat has sailed. Um, Everyone is trying to get the robots. Beirut, we have robots in here, and um, the acquisition of the robot is increasing. This is on the on the other side of um, on the right hand side. You could see this graph. Uh, the uh, the uptake of the robotic um, uh, machines is increasing in the UK, uh, in England, and the hospitals that do not use robots they're losing patients. So although the evidence is not great, but still. Everyone wants to use it, um, and, and everyone wants to get on an, on the bandwagon of this. Uh, but you may say, I don't need uh, strong evidence to say, uh, actually, Mercedes-Benz Mercedes is a fantastic car. It's very obvious it's a fantastic car. Everyone knows that. You don't need a randomized trial to, to know this. Um, actually, um, the randomized trials and the systematic reviews and the, the audit that you do for, for your research is, is essential to improve the technology. Um, and improve the, the, the application of it. So it's not only to prove it's effective, it's just to improve the, uh, um, the application of this technology. Um, what are the challenges for lower and middle income countries? Um, I think uh, the cost mainly and the availability of, of the technology. Um, I, I identify these. And I think in the, in the near future, wearables and augmented reality would be um, more accessible uh, than the hardware and the wireless network. Probably wireless network will, make, will take many years to be available in um, middle-income countries, but wearables will be available, augmented reality most certainly. Um, 
We'll talk a bit about scaling, scaling of healthcare. Um, this is how you take an idea from nothing to make it, to make everyone use it and uh, to, to get everyone to do, uh, uh, to do this. First, you start with the idea. You start with the, um, with the te technology or the technique that you want to uh, introduce. Uh, it's one patient first, um, uh, one doctor, one patient, and then um, you do, uh, you, you assess what you do, you look for the evidence, uh, and you audit what you did, um, and you take it to the next level where you do a few patients. Um, you do a follow-up test, and the next step would be once your hospital or uh, the unit you're working in has adopted this, uh, you could move to the wider scale. You have to identify what we call champions, um, people who believe in your idea, who believe that this will be useful, and these will take up your idea, they will um, adopt it, they will, um, they will test it in their units, and once that process is successful, now then you'll be ready to take it to the uh, full scale, which is an acceler accelerated uh, exponential uh, um, uh, adoption of your, of your idea. Uh, you need the experts, you need the infrastructure for this, and of course the, uh, you need to identify um, the community that you're working in. And uh, along the way, you need to always collect your evidence. So this is a, an um, example of the um, scaling. Um, we introduce in our unit a, a, a new technique for uh, taking sample from the prostate. A transperineal biopsy decreases the risk of sepsis and infection. And... Um, we had a period where we had an overlap between the transperineal and the old technique, and eventually uh, we adopted this new technique. And, and then the next step was to get everyone in the hospital to use the same technique, which we, they, they did. We collected uh, our results, and we found that it's actually it's, uh, uh, much better than the um, uh, usual technique. And uh, now we're in the phase where we, uh, we, ha we found our champions in our local uh, <clears throat> local hospitals, they will use the same technique, our technique, they're learning how to use it, and the next step is to scale it up to the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, for me to go around the United Kingdom telling everyone how to use it, it will take me years and it will be very expensive. Uh, so with the help of Proximy, we'll be able to, to do this with, uh, with the augmented reality, where we'll be able to train surgeons from around the UK. They will be in their own hospital. I'll be in, uh, in London. I'll be able to teach them, support them, give them feedback, and they'll be, they'll be able to perform the procedure. This can be applied to um, uh, any other similar, uh, similar ideas. Um, so in conclusion, the challenges, of course, are very huge. Uh, it's very important that we um, uh, they integrate the, uh, with the social and local uh, community that you work in and you need to engage individuals or uh, your local champions and even the state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hajj. And it's, I think it's, again, really important to highlight some of the key points he made around scale, around evidence, and around cost effectiveness when you look at how you scale these technologies. So thank you for raising those points. <coughs> I'd like to bring us to our next speaker. He's Lias Bustani. He's a strategy and technology consultant with 11 years of experience. He served as the chief, chief operating officer for WAMDA, a senior, and then a senior associate for strategy and, and a consultant for Accenture France. He led the design and implementation for entrepreneurship programs for the Expo 2020 Dubai, the World Bank, General Electric, and the American University of Beirut and Beirut Digital District, amongst others. Significant experience in managing the WAMDA Research Lab for in-depth research on entrepreneurship and innovation, and now he lectures at AUB and the ESA Business School and, a and is a mentor for startups across accelerators, including Speed at BDD, Flat6 Labs, and ESA. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. 
So uh, the angle that we will be taking in this presentation is to uh, to put a bit the spotlight on uh, the homegrown, uh, uh, the grassroots innovation, the, uh, and uh, how entrepreneurs in the MENA region are trying to tackle also the challenges from their point of view. So we have seen how government should be uh, should be addressing it. We have also seen how technologies developed in the West can address these challenges. Now we're gonna take the the other angle, which is. From, uh, from the entrepreneurs themselves. So uh, taking a step, uh, a step back, going a bit out of uh, healthcare, looking at the entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem at large, here we see how it's, uh, it's starting to gain uh, momentum. So uh, here you have on this graph the investments that are being done across uh, the years from 2014 where we had uh, around $140 million of uh, VC investments in MENA startups to uh, 2017 where uh, it is uh, in f 560 million. Now, uh, on, on in the gray, you can, see it's, uh, you can see outliers, which are Karim and Souk. So, uh, but uh, those, uh, th those companies show us also the potential of technology startup coming from the region. Souk was acquired by, uh, by Amazon for 650 million. Uh, actually, yesterday, the, the deal was closed finally, but it was announced earlier. Uh, Karim uh, is also valued at $1.5 billion. And uh, th they are um, also in talks with Uber for, uh, for potential acquisition. Um, so this is just to say that it, looking at entrepreneurs from the region, there is potential, there are things happening and growing. Now, if you, we want to look at the drivers of, uh, of these investments, uh, we notice that healthcare is actually the only one with growing investments in the MENA region. So on the, on the right side, you can, you can find the disclosed investments, the disclosed uh, funding increased by 7%. And uh, like, uh, you have examples of startup like Visita, for example, that, that got 20 million from a number of investors across the region. Now, if, if you want to look deeper, so healthcare um, funding got in 2017 $30 million. Now, it's way, um, uh, way behind uh, the global market, which is at $4.5 billion. But things are starting to, uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to increase. We can also see some examples like uh, Visita, which is a, um, a coming from Egypt, a startup uh, so to connect physician and, uh, and for, uh, for bookings, you have Altubi, you have Bayzat, which is from the UAE, with, uh, which deals with uh, health uh, uh, insurance. And also you have Health at Hand, which is about uh, a video platform to connect you to physicians uh, have ha that have a US uh, experience. Uh, so wh why, why do we need uh, entrepreneurs and startups from the region also to, to be involved? So we have a high demand for healthcare and you have problems that are specific for, for the MENA region. So a high population growth, we have elderly population growth as well, and we have obesity and non-communicable uh, diseases that are specific to the region with 87% uh, uh, deaths from uh, obesity and non-communicable uh, diseases in, uh, in GCG, um, expected in 2030. We also have a huge undersupply of, uh, of healthcare with a low number of hospital uh, beds, low number of physicians, and a huge uh, um, uh, gap in the numbers of nurses also. Like for 10,000 people in MENA we have 28 nurses, whereas in, in the US we have 97. So the traditional healthcare system will not be able to, to cope with, uh, with the growth and with the use of technology uh, we, we have to, uh, to find solutions. Those are samples of uh, startups across uh, the MENA region that are finding solutions. So we, we went through, through a couple of examples. Of course, you can recognize Proximi and uh, Kaju Diagnostics also from, uh, from Lebanon. Now, here we're seeing, so we did a, uh, at WAMDA, we have done a research uh, a couple of years ago where we had interviewed 100 entrepreneurs and, uh, and experts from the region to try to understand the health tech ecosystem and what are the different challenges that they are facing. So here we see a mapping that was done uh, to see what kind of solutions are being uh, uh, created by, by the different startups. So from home care 
to uh, solutions uh, for medication and insurances and to solutions also to improve uh, the care in hospitals. Uh, as well, uh, we have different solutions that are tackling uh, the human body element, like uh, uh, pancreas, we have uh, spike, for example, uh, so cardiodiagnostic, we, we mentioned it. For East, we have kin trends, which is for people who have uh, deaf, uh, uh, who are deaf. Um, if you look at the um, path to scale of startups, so here we have how startups move from an ID stage to prototyping, to launching, sustaining, and scaling. So the majority of startups are actually in the prototyping and testing phase, and they are f facing a number of challenges that we will see on, uh, on the next slide. So 46% of, uh, of the startups we identified were in the prototype and testing phase, and their average uh, uh, age is uh, between one and two years. So what are the challenges of, uh, of those entrepreneurs? So first is access to, uh, to capital. Uh, and access to smart capital specifically. So already it's a challenge for uh, tech startups to find capital. For healthcare startups, it's even more, uh, more challenging. Uh, we have a minimal uh, testing resources. So 41% uh, uh, of startups have difficulty testing and conducting clinical trials to prove their, uh, their concepts. We have difficulty in forming partnerships. So 74% experience uh, these challenges, and of course, you need uh, partnerships in order to test uh, your product and, uh, and to get access to markets. Um, also, we had worked with General Electric in, uh, uh, in Dubai for a program where we matched them with startups in, uh, in different industries, one of which was healthcare, and we noticed how there is an interest to, uh, to work, but given how, uh, how the industry is uh, re regulated and the fears uh, uh, for quality, et cetera, uh, doing partnerships on the health tech se sector is much more challenging than other sectors. Um, also, there is a technical talent gap, so uh, finding developers, finding uh, uh, people with uh, business skills is a challenge here. And on, in addition, if you want them to have a medical hat, uh, it's even more uh, challenging. And uh, the, the fifth barrier is lack of compliance clarity. So uh, th this is uh, a main challenge uh, that uh, we face. For example, in AUB, we have an accelerator that, uh, we, that we're doing with the Faculty of Engineering. And you have some startups that are coming up with uh, uh, healthcare ideas. Uh, and also they are forming cross-disciplinary teams between uh, uh, engineers, mechanical engineers, uh, techni technical engineers, and uh, uh, from the Faculty of, uh, of uh, Medicine. Um, and here, the lack of compliance is, is a big issue, so being able to, uh, to also understand regulation, to see in the different countries what we can test, what we cannot test, uh, the, uh, when do we need the FDA approvals or not, those are uh, challenges also that we're trying to, to address. And uh, finally, there is a, a low consumer uh, uh, buy-in uh, reported by, uh, by the startups. So in, in order to be able to address all of these challenges, no one can do it alone. Different, uh, so different players from the ecosystem, each one should chip in from organizing the overall uh, landscape to providing funding to providing a specialized mentorship. Uh, and the role of universities is also very important. And this is why uh, now AUB is working on the AUB Art Park, which will, uh, will also support in that regard. Voila, thank you. It's a very interesting topic, and I'm sure we could sit for days talking about it, seeing what's happening to the ecosystem. Um, I'm sure there'll be many questions from the audience. I'd like to move us on to the next speaker. Uh, Leia Yerevyanyan is a, has a background in clinical psychology and has extensive experience working in the mental health space. She's currently working as a strategic alliance partner for a UK-based startup called Medopad in London. Her role is to work with government bodies, with ministries of health and key opinion leaders and stakeholders in the field of healthcare and medicine to focus on joint development opportunities and projects internationally. She's also currently working with research labs who are using artificial intelligence and data analytics to improve diagnostics, patient care, and to bridge inefficiencies in the healthcare sector. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, my name is Lea. It's great to be back here in Beirut, a city where I grew up in. Um, I studied psychology and I worked as a clinical psychologist for a while at Der Salib. I'm very passionate about the use of uh, technology to improve healthcare and patients. Sorry. And I'm a strategic alliances manager at Medopad. So basically, I look after our um, business operations in uh, the Middle East and in North Africa. Um, but again, uh, it's great to be uh, back in Lebanon, especially at AUB, uh, which is world renowned for its university and hospital system. So our vision at Meadowpad is to create a world in which people can live longer. And our solutions involve leveraging patient data sets. Sorry, one second. <sighs> okay. Uh, to bridge the gaps and the inefficiencies in healthcare. Inherently, we're a digital solution, and like other digital solutions, um, our solutions um, mean that the cost of deployment and the means of um, distribution mean that we're potentially very scalable. But of course, in order to scale, we have to work with our healthcare partners, like pharmaceutical companies, government bodies, and uh, hospitals. So from an impact perspective, I'm going to speak about two case studies. This uh, module was created for um, patients suffering from a rare form of pediatric cancer called DIPG, or diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. And um, as you can see, the module has functionalities or trackers which monitor things like PROMS, so patient reported outcome measures, um, which is, comes in the form of a daily check-in questionnaire to assess the quality of life of the patient a medication tracker for drug adherence purposes, and a video module. Now, as some of you might already know, one of the side effects of chemotherapy is that it affects uh, motor function. So patients often have to come in after a week of treatment um, and do something called a six-minute walk test, which is a clinically validated test where uh, patients have to walk for six minutes up and down a corridor, and then they see how they're performing um, based on their uh, walking. And due to the development of the video module, patients can now do the video at home, so do their six-minute walk test, get the video captured, and then the video then gets sent to the clinician via the app, and then the physician can then decide with the clinical team whether or not this patient needs to come in for further assessment and see how they're responding to their treatment. The second case study that I'm gonna speak about is a um, module that we've created in partnership with Johnson & Johnson for their Actillion division, um, which is currently being used at the Royal Free in London and this is for patients uh, suffering from pulmonary arterial hypertension, or PAH. And this type of module has, again, almost the same types of uh, functionalities, but the difference is, is that here, um, patients often have to come to the hospital for this type of disease, and they have to drive for a very long t uh, hours, so for three or four hours, because there are only five centers of care in the UK and they just have to come for very relatively simple checkups. So again, things like uh, six minute walk test and to get their vital signs collected. So blood pressure and heart rate. And Actelian said that they'll provide the drug, we'll provide the technology, and then together patients can go on, do their um, tests at home, and then their scores can get graphed for the clinical team to view. And then once a month, the clinical team goes on the physician portal of the app, which is the doctor's version of the app, and they see how their uh, patients are doing and if their um, conditions have deteriorated by let's say 20% or whatever it means that they decided that they would use as a baseline. And then based on that, again, make uh, clinical decisions. I think that these are all uh, relatively very simple ways which illustrate the use of data in uh, healthcare and healthcare technology. And uh, I think that obviously this is nothing new. We've always had data except it wasn't called data before. It was called things like patient labs, uh, reports, and x-rays, uh, things like that. And I think that the more the field of uh, technology will advance in healthcare, the more we will be able to do things like reduce costs, reduce unnecessary hospital visits, and um, eventually lead to better outcomes. Thank you.
Thank you, Leah. Again, I very much like how you brought it back to the patient and putting kind of the patient at the center of the innovation. And what we're seeing from the range of speakers already this morning is all the different components that one must consider when looking at digital transformation or health transformation. Uh, that brings up on to our, our final speaker. We're very honored to have uh, Samia Melham. She's the global lead for digital development community of practice. Her operational responsibilities include investment operations in digital platforms and services, as well as thought leadership on digital development. She has recently contributed to the Digital Development Partnership setup and is now leading the DTP's digital governmental analytical work. She has led and contributed to digital governmental transformational projects in Rwanda, Egypt, Philippines, Burkina Faso, Kenya, Lebanon, Morocco, Guinea, and Cote d'Ivoire, leveraging disruptive technologies to improve the delivery of public services such as education, health, and social protection. She's currently focusing on digital identification programs for regional integration and implementation of digital economy enablers. And in her previous assignments, she was working in several regions, such as the East and Central Europe, Middle East, and Africa. She holds degrees in electrical engineering, computer science, as well as an MBA in finance. Welcome. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, you're not too tired. I'm your last presenter, so I'm going to try to make it as fun as possible. Um, my presentation will focus on the role of governments and on somewhat their partners, such as the World Bank, and we have here World Health Organizations are um, doing in that space of digital with a focus on health. The first thing I want to say is uh, you probably all know that in our private lives, our use of technologies have dramatically increased. And increasingly, we are seeing a stark contrast between the way society uses technologies and the ways governments use uh, technologies. And there is a considerable lag in how government consumes technology to deliver services. This, this slide is about traffic. And every year, traffic is doubling. So in 2016, this was what was consumed uh, in social media, for instance, and messaging, and today it's four times more. Where is government in all this? Um, government is trying to use technology, which is today ubiquitous, in delivering services. You've all heard of Internet of Things, which is really deploying sensors, deploying devices that um, read from the air, the pollution, uh, traffic, congestion, etc., and then allow for traffic system or health systems to react. In the health field, we're using more and more med tech. You've seen the latest Apple iWatch, which can detect your heartbeat and can predict if you're gonna have a heart attack. We're seeing many wearables and many new devices uh, being created around patients and being able to connect to healthcare for emergency response, hospitals or doctors. This will not be possible without broadband and the whole infrastructure that is needed for digital. And if I focus for a moment at where we are right now, the Mashrek, the region is very much behind in many ways in the telecom infrastructure. The broadband that is uh, in the area here is, a, is way too expensive. And what Les presented on the small, medium-sized businesses if these emerging companies were to have broadband subscription, they are significantly behind the same companies in, comp in, in region like Europe, in Dubai, etc., because they will be paying a lot more for a lot less of the service, and um, broadband is extremely necessary for success of, of digital. So in the whole area here, there is a, a need to increase competition to uh, improve services for broadband and to also um, pay attention to the digital divide between the cities and rural, where you have much older people, technology is more difficult for them, there's a lot more illiteracy, and the women are the ones that are the most disadvantaged here. And you see stark contrast for countries like Iraq, like Jordan, I don't have the number for Lebanon, but there is a gender digital divide as well. So what do governments need to do uh, to, to, to better leverage technology? For many years now, governments have been investing in many sectors, including health, to deliver services, with a lot of um, failure. 
and few success stories. What the recommendation is today from the World Bank and many other of our partners is there, in, there is a need to address what we call foundational infrastructure in a coherent, shared way. Many of the speakers talked about sharing data. So the broadband infrastructure, the data centers, the servers, the uh, authentication of users, cybersecurity, the ID, the ID for people, whether they're patients, doctors, nurses, etc. It all needs to be created as a shared service that all ministries use. So it's not each one of them reinventing the way each time and spending a lot of unnecessary effort to reconstruct uh, infrastructure and data that exists already. What is needed from each ministry or agency is to uh, specialize in their services. In this case, it's health and really build all the services, either themselves or in partnership with private providers, and we've seen many examples before. So as many of you said before, the three top applications that we are seeing emerge in the digital age are e-commerce, e-education, and e-health. And they're all part of what we call today the digital economy. In fact, the World Bank is uh, in conversation today with the government of Lebanon on the digital economy project. If I were to put numbers, the overall uh, output of the world is around 80 trillion every year, that's the global GDP, and digital economy today is 15 trillion out of that. And it's increasing every year. And it's all these services that you have seen described before on health, it's e-commerce, uh, Lies told us about the startups that is being purchased by Amazon, and so it's big numbers. How do we digitize the health ecosystem? It's been done in many other countries. Uh, it's a partnership, like I said earlier, between the private providers and the government. It has to really address all the components of the health ecosystem and in the smartest possible way, apply technology while connecting everyone, connecting the patients, connecting government, the payers, the healthcare providers, the hospitals, and digitizing and modernizing the services that today are done on a manual paper-based way. And you all know that with digital, we can bypass many steps. We can skip the sequential approach in a workflow. And of course, we can bypass the paper. And many steps can be actually completely eliminated in a procedure related to acquiring a health service. So what we're looking at in digital health is that sort of eight pillars that you see at the very top level, the lead leadership regulation and enabling environment to use digital. Biometrics is a perfect example on that, to how to regulate and enable the use of biometrics, of digital signature, for instance, how to make data privacy part of the law and protect the, the, the consumers. Who are the users? Making sure all the users are addressed here. And it's not just the patient and families, but it's also the providers, the hospitals, the doctors, the labs, etc. Process and workflow, we talked about that. We're seeing a lot of applications around data analytics and predictive artificial intelligence, but for that, we need data. We need solid data from, uh, from the patient's records, clinical data, etc. And this is probably the last stage in a digital health ecosystem. And again, the most important part that we see that I'm working on is how do we identify people? So really the names, the last name, their date of birth, and making sure that identification is really following that person from birth to death with a unique ID number. We talked about the infrastructure, the broadband, of course the power, the equipment needed, both computers but also medical equipment, the technicians that are needed, we heard a lot about the waste. A lot of this equipment that is trashed does not need to be trashed. It's trashed because nobody can fix it. So investing in technicians, and that's also part of job creation. And at the same time, uh, using academic institutes such as uh, AUB to create the capabilities, the skills of these innovators of today and tomorrow. Last but not least, a very important topic, and I can't stress enough on this, and it could be a source of growth for a country like Lebanon, focusing on skills in cybersecurity and really making sure that facilities that 
are, are secure, data is secure, and all these great applications we're writing are not going to be hacked and patients' record um, sold to, to people who mean a lot of harm. Um, I want to stress a bit more here on digital identification, and the World Bank has been in the last three to five years uh, in partnership with government investing billions of dollars in identification. Healthcare is one of the areas where we get the most demand. We have it also for education. Lots of countries want it for voting, but voting is not a very sustainable demand. We look at health and ID like the most interesting, um, well, sorry, health and education like the most uh, uh, interesting and sustainable type of demand we get. We have lots of success stories around the world. Um, in Peru, in India, in Estonia, even in Africa now in some countries. And the success comes from the fact that identification of people comes from both a government and people who want to make everyone count. Everybody counts not to be policed, but to receive services such as health. And I was recently in, in July in Peru and I brought a lot of my clients with me. And Peru is a country with a lot of mountains and 30 million people. It took the government nine years to bring together and enroll all the citizens, give IDs to even the newborn, even biometrics to the newborn, and immediately in parallel start to provide services in health, education, and cash transfer for the very poor. So it, it can be done. In health, we're seeing a lot of new services and applications. These things did not exist a few years ago. So amazing opportunities for youth with good ideas as long as they get some seed funding and champions around them. We had in the earlier session uh, the example of EPIC. EPIC was started by a woman. It's one of the most successful uh, success stories in innovation in health. We have, I see every day a lot of innovators, a lot of entrepreneurs, especially in health, in education, many women that are really trying to get the investors to come listen to their pitch and engage with them. And uh, this project that I was talking about, Digital Economy in Lebanon, uh, plans to do a little bit what Elias was advocating, which is really matching the innovators, the entrepreneurs with the venture capital coaching them, giving them best practices so that they minimize their chances of failure and maximize their chance of success. Uh, my last two slides, the World Bank has been investing, like I said, a lot in digital health. My colleague Nadwa, who is here, she's the project manager for an e-health project in partnership with government of Lebanon. We have these everywhere, in Morocco, in Côte d'Ivoire, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, all these around the principle of universal health access and better access to services. And of course today, how can you not use technology for that? Paper is not gonna, what's gonna make these projects successful. I'm gonna do a bit of a deep dive on eGabon, a $57 million project in Gabon, middle income country, two million people. And the objective of that project is to improve timeliness and availability of information to support delivery and management of health services and at the same time, the second one, to foster development of e-health application and services by, it's not said here, by young entrepreneurs. And we calculated um, that uh, this is part of the uh, management information health system that I showed that, that is being developed as part of that project. But we calculated that with the second component, that of innovation and entrepreneurship, with all the cost, with all the savings that comes on the plus side, and with all the generated new growth and new businesses that will be experienced in the country, we would actually have a pretty positive rate of return of around 18%, which is pretty high for such projects. So these are projects that are good for the people, good for the country, and if they are well managed, they are good investments, and um, we want to have more of these. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. That was a lot of food for thought. Um, I think what I'd like to do, because I'm sure the audience will have a lot of questions, I'll ask one question of each of the speakers, and then we'll open it up for um, a, a wider Q&A. Um, I'd like to start with you, Smile. Uh, I'm sorry. You talked a lot about process and pathway innovation as opposed to product innovation, and how important that is as well with regard to change management and structure as opposed to just 
buying a, a five Tesla MRI, you know, how it's a problem. I didn't like my voice. Okay. <laughs> Should I just speak? Oh, it's working. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to know whose role did you think, or do you think it is, or is it governments that need to help streamline these process and these structures, or do you think it's uh, private sector, public sector? I'd be very interested in your views on that and maybe any experience you've had with that. Absolutely. Um, m many thanks, uh, uh, Nadine, because this is a very thoughtful question, and it relates to things that you've been hearing all day from other, uh, from other panels and sessions. Um, health is everybody's business. Government cannot, will, will not be able to do everything alone. To improve access in low and middle income countries, it will not be possible only with the government or NGOs or private sector. Everyone has to, be, has to play its role all together. And this is, uh, and this is something, and um, I have to share with you this. Before uh, coming here, um, I, only, I, uh, I took a new, a new role in WHO. I became the, head of, the acting head of mission in Iraq. No, thank you. It's a country that has been, Iraq is, as you all know, has been devastated by, you know, a series of conflicts and ongoing actions that really compromised health. Now, the country is faced, the original population is lacking good and essential coverage, plagued with also a problem of, uh, of, uh, of refugees, of IDPs, internally displaced populations living in camps, which relates to the first session that we've been hearing. And most of the, and I have to apologize for this statement, but most of the, of the, of the presentations and the ideas I've seen today really related to high income countries. And the whole session is about low and middle income countries. And I keep looking at the, log, at the slogan of this forum, one, two, three times, five times, you live in places where people are living either in camps or even those that are not in emergency for low and middle income countries are really poor. Most of them are not holding mobile, smart mobile phones to start with, to begin with the apps. Most of them are actually using very uh, low profile, low technology Nokia phones of the people that I know. There is illiteracy rates of 40% in most of the Middle East countries. In a country that I know, it's, it's around 40%. So how do you expect him to teach him to use the app and start do? It's difficult. It's not that easy in this part of the world. You, you, we can aspire to do it. That's fine with me. We can start. This is OK. But the reality right now is that all of these players, which I mentioned, and I have a good example from Iraq, when we want to serve the camps and the refugees at the camps, we want, this is an area, if you leave it, it becomes, it, it becomes a spot for, for communicable disease for the host country as well. So what do we do? The Germans, this is now people coming together to improve access. The Germans came and built a new primary health care center, not expensive at all, beside these camps. WHO and the UN agencies compile all the resources to support the provision of essential medicines and technologies for those primary health care centers for these people. And the private sector and NGOs came and we contracted them to run those, this primary health care center for us. So the, the private sector built something, the NGOs are running it, WHO and the UN agencies are already funding it. This has improved access to technologies for these low people. Don't speak to me about robotic surgery and, and things like that. In low and middle income countries, if you want to reach the mass, speak to me about simple, simple technology. Speak to me about innovative ideas that can reach people. And don't speak to me about millions and millions of dollars that has to be spent to institute a system. That's my take. Thank you. I think you make some very relevant points. And I think um, it brings us nicely on to uh, Dr. Hajj because you made the point about you know, these expensive devices and actually what value do they add? And the evidence has actually showed that very few procedures, no, no improvement in outcome, and actually very few procedures are actually done with the robot. 
Um, I wanted to move us on to a different subject, that's okay. And what's great about this panel is that everyone has come from a completely different angle in terms of health and innovation and funding. So it's going to give us a lot of opportunities to talk about a number of subjects. But you talked about 5G. And we're starting to just hear about 5G and the emerging technology that will be 5G and what it could mean, not just for healthcare, but for the world and in this kind of economy that we live in and in this world we live in. I wanted to very briefly, and I know this may not be your specific area of expertise, but I wanted to know what impact you felt or what change you felt 5G would have. And I know King's College, where you're based, is the first unit, or first hospital, first play, uh, university to actually have a 5G tower in your partnership with Ericsson. So if you could just give us a little bit about what you think about 5G, it would be great. Thank you, Nadine. <coughs> yes, um, 5G um, will come in in the next few years um, in high-income high countries and mainly in the UK. They will start, Vodafone started um, uh, trialing 5G very l for very limited period of time uh, in the next few months. Uh, it needs a lot of infrastructure and it needs a lot of um, investment to use, to use the technology. The technology mainly is um, uh, connecting everything together and uh, is connecting uh, not only people, as I said, uh, but connecting things. And I think the connection of things would be the more important, more important aspect of it. Uh, something that you, when it comes to your country, will, you'll not notice it because it will happen behind the scenes. It will happen without you paying attention to it. It will be automatic and it will be ubiquitous, just sim similar to what the, tel uh, the stethoscope is now for us 200 years on. Uh, so 5G will come to everyone. Uh, it will, of course, start in the, um, uh, in the rich countries, but it will happen everywhere and I think will even in uh, low and middle income countries, even uh, in here, I'm sure the, uh, the governments will be very interested in this because it will improve their, uh, uh, their income and they will want to be involved in this and uh, uh, um, uh, the private companies will be interested in bringing the 5G to the middle income countries as well. Thank you very much. Um, I'll move us on because I think we're, we're starting to run short of time. I just wanted to ask a couple more questions. One to uh, Tulia, so you talked about innovation, grassroots innovation, investment. What advice do you have to entrepreneurs who are starting here, who may have received their first round of funding from here, but don't want to develop their products just for this region? They, they have a, a more global vision of what they want to do with their products and their ideas so that they can actually compete on a global scale. How do they move from being a, a Middle East product, or a Lebanon product, a UAE product, to being a global product? Okay, so I, I think you're better positioned to, uh, to, to answer <laughs> this. But, uh, um, so uh, you, usually, like startups should have a certain target segment. So, and as Dr. Adham was saying, um, if you want to move to the West, it's a different uh, type of, of people, different spending, uh, the power, different uh, sophistication, etc. So from Lebanon, what, if you want to, go to scale outside, usually there are two, two routes. One is going to the MENA region because of the similarities of language and, uh, and culture, or going and addressing the emerging markets. And hence, also, you, you are going to uh, South America and, and Asia and markets that have similar type of, uh, uh, of needs and uh, of lack of infrastructure and what have you. So they need first to, to start picking uh, uh, their market. And then th there is one, uh, one additional point that we, we had discussed previously offline, which is about how to approach this, because when uh, we, uh, we typically talk about startups and we, we advocate a lot the lean startup methodologies and, uh, and uh, being able to come up with a very basic prototype, testing it in the market, taking feedback and then coming back. And, uh, and I, by the way, today I have a session on this <laughs> specifically, but it doesn't really apply for healthcare startups because there, if you mess it up, uh, uh, the, the stakes are high and uh, you need to do your research, user research and uh, problem validation and ID validation before you can jump and, uh, and develop uh, your, uh, your product. Great. Thank you, and I think there is a point to be made about trying to create a target segment. But I think also it's important to realize that if you can create technologies that are scalable and simple, they can be used in a refugee camp as much as they can be used in a world-class center in the middle of the United States. So 
it's a balance. We'll move on quickly to Leia. I had a, you brought up the very important point of the patient and the patient being at the center of it. I want to just very quickly ask you, what did you think was the importance or the role of PROMS, patient reported outcome measures? Okay, so PROMS or patient reporting outcome measures are essentially uh, questionnaires that turn things like symptoms into a numerical value. And I think that the benefits of uh, incorporating PROMS is twofold in the short term. They're very important because they provide immediate feedback on the patients and long term because they do that on a, uh, a longer span of time, which is very important, uh, especially to assess things clinically. And I think that PROMS are now currently being used as well in hospitals just to see which areas they, can, uh, they need to be improved, especially uh, in the NHS in the United Kingdom. And they're also important because they give the patient um, a sense of how they might be feeling and how their symptoms might be worsening or getting better because essentially it is an encapsulation of um, the way that they see how their state of health is either improving or deteriorating. I think it's very important. I think we're seeing more and more that PROMS are becoming a critical KPI in, in terms of healthcare and reported outcomes for the patient, that the patient feels they have an onus to, to sort of report on. Uh, and then my final question to Sami, I wanted to ask, you've had a, an amazing career working with different countries, different economies, different governments, and trying to digitize, be it healthcare or other mechanisms within them. What would be your advice to Lebanon now as it embarks on this digitization journey? Um, and I know you're, you're, you're playing an important role in it, but perhaps to those in the room and those involved with the Institute, uh, what would be your advice? Thank you. Um, this is a very good question. The first thing uh, that I advise my clients and Lebanon in general is what uh, Adnan said, really work together. You cannot uh, have different donors, different projects around the same outcome. So everybody has to work together. And this is a long-term investment. Governments don't like to hear it. But all these success stories that I've seen are projects started by a government and finished by another. So really, uh, at the technical level, you start something, you stick to it. It will never be perfect but you keep the data. You make things interoperable, like the speaker before me said. In digital, the biggest failure is you invest a lot in a big system and you don't fill it, you don't have the data in it. And then you're, you call it a failure, you scrap it, you go to donors or to the government, you get more money to redo exactly the same thing and nothing has changed in your teamwork, nothing has changed about your values as a, as a society. So working together is very important. Second one, involve the citizen, involve the beneficiaries. For instance, uh, the biggest quick win for health is give access to information. There's so much information about health. First of all, it makes people more in control, uh, good proactivity and et cetera, but also it helps the patient uh, provide suggestions for those implementing these projects. So um, work with partners, work with your stakeholders, communicate a lot and go to the rural areas where people maybe don't understand your academic, educated people language and make sure the data is always salvageable and uses open standards and interoperate so you can always keep it from one generation to another. Thank you very much and thank you to the panelists for giving their uh, wonderful lectures and for uh, letting me ask my questions. But we'll open it up to the floor if there are any questions. Maybe we can take a few. Have one there. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, I have a question for Dr. Ismail. Uh, you talked about needing to have policies in place to effectively implement uh, health technologies. Uh, yet you're speaking about a place like uh, Iraq where policies or like the government systems may not necessarily be intact and how does implementing health technologies look in that context and um, also to uh, Mr. Elias do entrepreneurs get support for the protection of their ideas when they are expanding and I guess for all the panelists how are we te contextualizing technologies for cultures that are less individual based and more community-based. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks for the question. Uh, um, let me let myself explain to the audience that there are two cases we're speaking about here. 
There is a case of a country in absolute emergency where the virtually there's no government. So therefore, the policies, the legal mandate, legal framework are set aside. We have to intervene to stop the deterioration of health, and this is the example which I've given. Uh, but in any case, it necessitates. Now, Iraq, for example, is moving from pure emergency into more developmental, trying to achieve universal health coverage. There, the government should start doing its mandate of running the health. There, we should put the health technology policies framework and start. So if we're speaking about developmental, there has to be a legal framework through the policy. If we're speaking about Yemen, Syria, and all of these places where the government is virtually not existent in many places, and we are running, then of course, speaking about policies will be, we go directly, we skip many steps, and we go directly to, to, to try to save the population. So this is, these are the, 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 the differences between the two situations. So on the point of uh, protection of an idea, so um, we, li we like to, uh, to, to promote that the idea is the least important part of uh, the process of uh, coming up with a company or finding a solution because m many people have ideas, it's, it's about believing in it and being able to implement it and having the right uh, uh, skill set. And then once you're visible on the radar, you would have already had some traction and some penetration. Uh, now, if you want to protect your idea, th there are some, you, you can do patents uh, in different countries, etc. But we usually uh, try to downplay this site, saying it's not really important at this stage, just focus on validating this idea, on, on getting to the market, and then we'll... Uh, uh, we'll find the right solutions. Hi, I'm Gavin from Johannesburg, South Africa, working with the International Decision Support Initiative. I just wanted to echo what Dr. Adman said around HTA, um, and then just permit me to be a little provocative for a second. Um, I'm working around Africa in terms of, you know, introducing a, um, HTA and helping countries think about that. Uh, the Minister of Tanzania, she wants to introduce um, RPADs to every single medical officer there. But now this is a country that can't even afford um, the blankets when there's babies delivered. And they're sitting in a situation where maternal mortality is around 500 per 100,000 women. Um, at the same time, they can't even afford to uh, update their standard treatment guidelines. So they're also wanting to introduce this fantastic new technology that um, improves blood diagnosis and transmission. But then again, they've also got issues um, around there's new technologies, sofosfaba, trastuzumab, which yeah. first world countries are saying, hang on, we can't afford these. But Tanzania is saying, oh, there's this brilliant technology. We're going to put it on our, on our essential medicines list and provide it. So I think there also needs to be a responsibility around introducing these innovations. They may say lies, but they co that's at the cost of sacrificing others. Zambia's now got a whole lot of new hospitals and have proved their oncology, but their health budget hasn't increased. So medical officers are moving from, you know, simple giving birth to fancy oncology centers. Um, you know, where does that responsibility lie? That was just my comment, but broadly, you know, where is the MENA region in terms of introducing HTA mm -hmm. um, okay, and thinking about these things and essential medicines list, et cetera? Thanks. If I, if I may, uh, th um, Many thanks for allowing me to explain to the audience what do we mean by HTA for those of you. Anyone here is, is, is familiar or just give you a brief what is exactly is he referring to as health technology assessment? Okay, let us assume that you have uh, three, three, three children in your home. Everyone asks you to bring something back home and your budget doesn't allow for all of that. What, what are you going to do? You will prioritize. You will start looking which is more important to, to get first and then second, and then you postpone the ones that you cannot afford. This is exactly the process of an HTA. It looks into technologies in terms of health economics, cost effectiveness, in terms of their value, in terms of uh, our readiness to implement it, and so on. So we go on and bring all the, all the types of technologies, medicines, vaccines, devices that a country wants. 
But then we cannot afford to procure everything, otherwise we're in heaven. So what do we do? We start looking at which ones has the most impact on health, had the most cost-effective value, and we prioritize those. And we stop somewhere along, we set a line that this is our threshold, this is what we are going to procure. This is an ideal system, and actually this is the system that should be present in most less developed countries because they don't have all the resources. They should really watch out where are they spending money. But as you rightly mentioned, they go with a new technology that is coming out. They don't even know if it's cost effective or not, and they, they just want to procure without decent studies that shows. In Europe, this will never happen. If you just Google HTA in one of, in any, in any Google, in, in any search engine, you will find that every European country has at least one HTA agency that looks before throwing its investments in health and start buying stuff, they look into its cost effectiveness. So this is what we mean by HTA. Now, coming to your question, the MENA region and how, uh, how let's speak frankly here and I speak uh, honestly. Spending on health and medical products for many ministers of health in this region is a source of power. And that they are not willing to just you know, g give up like that. And I won't speak about other issues that we're all familiar with. So therefore, if you go and you know, hospital director visits a minister and say, I need this PET scan very urgently, this is a lifesaver. And if he's, if he's a friend, he'll just put it in, the, in there. And this will never happen if you have a decent HT agency that looks into the priority according to the uh, public health need and epidemiological profile of the country. Those are the important diseases that we have to tackle this year. These are the interventions required. And for those interventions to be applied, these are the medicines and devices we want. This is how the prioritization happens. And this is how a good setup. So we're trying to promote it a bit by bit. We were really successful with two countries in the Middle East, Iran and Tunisia. Tunisia they are both now set up good agencies. Needs some strengthening, but at least it's moving. Now we have aligned Egypt, Oman, Saudi Arabia, all of which you will hear very soon. It took us some time, some effort, some convincing, but it's really moving. And one of our latest things is that also we have co-partners now promoting. Tomorrow you will hear uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Maha Rabbat. She was an ex-minister of health. Uh, she leads a forum called MENA HPF Health Policy Forum. HTA became their, pro their prime projects. They, it consists of very influential people, political, at the political arena, at the health arena in the Middle East, and they carried out the mandate with WHO to promote this. It will take us some time to change the mindset, but we will do it and we will prevail because this is the only way to really streamline expenditures, unnecessary expenditures on technologies and spend it elsewhere where it make more impact on health and health indicators. This is what we're looking for. Thank you.